Thank you for starting your day with us. Uh, in my world, my day doesn't start until I hear from Jane Harmon. So that's how we are going to start as well. Uh, as, as all of you know, Jane Harmon is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Wilson Center. Jane will give a few opening remarks, and then she will introduce our special guest, Congressman Will Hurd. Jane, I'll turn the microphone over to you. Hi, everyone. Happy holidays. Appreciate your getting up early-ish uh, this morning. Uh, I understand from Will that our government will stay open, which is great news uh, to the Wilson Center family and I'm sure to uh, most of the rest of you. Um, I uh, am a recovering politician. I'm sure most of you know that. It is not a 12-step program. But my view of the United States Congress is it was perfect until I left in 2011. <laughs> and the rest is the rest. And it makes me very sad. This is not part of my intro, but what the heck. Uh, it makes me very sad to see good people in both parties. And uh, it doesn't make me so sad to see a few less interesting people in both parties, but good people in both parties be frustrated by the fact that the business model of Congress is broken. What I mean by that is that it is more uh, effective to blame the other side than it is to work with the other side. I'm looking at Will while I'm saying this. And I think that is just a, a, a colossal waste of time and waste of talent. So hopefully everyone in this room will help fix Congress in addition to save NAFTA. So um, let me uh, start with my breathless prose here, except I missed it. Okay. Uh, welcome. <laughs> it's a critical time in the NAFTA negotiation, something you didn't know. Uh, with. <laughs> Round five, five of seven just concluding in Mexico City. And some of the toughest challenges, like a sunset clause and suggestions that half of all car parts be manufactured in the US, are yet to even be discussed. Hmm, does sound like Congress. Uh, for the optimists in the room, and I'm one of them, or I would never have survived nine terms in Congress, uh, these negotiations are an opportunity to best position the North American region. Let me repeat that. The North American region, region, Canada, Mexico, and the United States to succeed in the 21st century economy. Did you know that other regions are, have growing populations? Not that this one doesn't, but it, it struck me the other day to read that uh, the EU, or I guess it's Europe, but I think it's EU countries, have 500 million people. I think I missed that movie. Um, other regions are growing very fast, and we need, our region uh, needs to step up and be part of the 21st century economy. Uh, I am a Californian. I represented a district in uh, Los Angeles. I always called Los Angeles North Mexico. Um, and so I'll let you in, in on a little uh, open secret, which is that while California exports a lot of technology, we also export tons of food. Got milk? We do. And you better believe that the dairy industry is watching the NAFTA talks closely. So, more broadly, Canada and Mexico are California's two biggest export markets. As technology le levels the playing field around the world, a strong framework for our region is needed now more than ever. The world will only continue to flatten, as uh, former Wilson scholar Tom Friedman, who learned everything he knows at the Wilson Center, <laughs> likes to say. And after all, Amazon, that is the company, didn't exist when NAFTA was first ratified. So um, let's see here. Uh, my short job is to introduce uh, folks who will speak to us. And I do want to start with Will Hurd. We appreciate you. Uh, thank you for your service in Congress. Thank you for your service before Congress. I mean, not everybody comes to Congress having had a serious career, but Will Hurd does and did. He represents a district in Texas, a crucial state in terms of this whole NAFTA uh, issue. And it is uh, a great pleasure to hear from him first, I think. We also have former US Ambassador to Canada, David Wilkins. Thank you. Uh, who is now at uh, Nelson Mullins. We have Matthew Rooney, 
of the George W. Bush Institute, welcome. We have Tiffany Melvin of NASCO, which is the North American Strategy for Competitiveness. Yes, we need one. Uh, and uh, we have our stars, our homegrown rock stars. Laura Dawson, who just uh, introduced me, uh, director of our First in Class Canada Institute, and uh, Duncan Wood, uh, director of our First in Class Mexico Institute. Of course, I'm totally objective, but I'm not kidding. If you want to get the scoop, not, not free from spin on Mexico and Canada, tune in here. So it gives me, I guess, great pleasure to introduce Will. Yes. Uh, Congressman Will Hurd, uh, who will make some opening remarks. Welcome here. Howdy. I don't, no Aggies, you know. I usually, I thought with you know with the Bush Center being involved, we may have had a, a few. I know you're at SMU, but there's a lot of Aggies that uh, go to SMU. Um, what? Thank you, Jane. And another round of applause to Jane, please, everybody. She, I, um, what the, the Wilson Center does um, on this important topic is, is really important, and the work that y'all have done is something that I use quite, quite often in, in my remarks. Um, for those that don't know me, um, I represent a district, 29 counties, two time zones, 820 miles of the border. It takes 10 and a half hours to drive across my district, more border than any other member of, of Congress. I also spent nine and a half years as an undercover officer in the CIA. Um, I was the guy in the back alleys at four o'clock in the morning collecting intelligence on threats to our homeland, but I also had to brief members of Congress, and I was pretty shocked by the caliber of our elected officials, and my mama said, you're part of the problem, part of the solution, so I ran for Congress, and I lost. I'm glad we don't tell that story anymore, Jane. Um, <laughs> and um, was in the private sector, helped clients grow in markets they had never been in before. I handled all of our Latin America business, spent a lot of time working with companies in Mexico. Um, the opportunity came to run in 14 and I took it. Now we all know this, um, um, you know, the US, Mexico and Canada build things together. Um, I see Chris Wilson over here who in his paper I quote all the time about, you know, the actual where goods are made and, and we, we understand that. Um, where we are right now, after the election, I think like everybody, I was nervous. Leading up to the first round, I was feeling pretty confident about the negotiations. Everybody that was going to be involved in the negotiations were saying, do no harm, make it better, we can do this quick. And then the negotiations started and I think everybody's confidence levels changed. Um, I will say this, three people are gonna decide the direction of these negotiations. And those three people have a worldview that's very different than us here in this room. And everybody who is gonna be influenced by a NAFTA 2.0 has tried to influence those three people. <clears throat> I would say to no avail. Now I would say the 80% on the cost of, of um, origin of goods from NAFTA regions, 50% from the United States, the five year sunset, all of that is an opening negotiation. <clears throat> My work with the White House and other projects, I've seen how they negotiated, that's a negotiation. Um, but what can we agree on as in those elements? And that's the piece that I don't know. I think there's one thing that can influence those three people that are gonna make this decision on that. And that's the markets. That's Wall Street. I just came back from New York City talking to a lot of folks in high finance. None of them think that there's a problem and everybody thinks that NAFTA 2.0 is gonna get signed. And like what usually happens with the markets, the markets are usually nine months behind um, actual trends. And so one of the things that those of us that have influence in this process is talking to, these, uh, talking to publicly traded companies we're all getting ready to see another earnings round that's coming up this week, or is it 12th or the 15th? I guess it was, that's today. Um, they need to be talking about one of the strategic concerns their company has is NAFTA. So I think that is the kind of influence that um, we can put on those three people that are ultimately gonna make this decision. Now, I'm usually an optimist. I always, I, I live by PMA. Positive mental attitude, something my father taught me all my life. Um, and, and, 
but um, we have to continue to make this case. Why are we here today? We're here today because people have forgotten the importance of free trade, right? Uh, Matt and, and their scorecard has showed very clearly that trade within NAFTA has increased, trade by NAFTA with everybody else has increased, and the U.S. trade within that has increased. Um, that sounds like a pretty good deal uh, to me. But we have to continue to make this case. I, I've, I've recently read a book called Against the Tide, and it's a summary of economic thoughts um, from um, you know, pre, in, in the BC era, all the way to like 1940. And what's funny is, prior to Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, which was actually, I, I didn't realize it was written in 1776. Prior to that point, um, the economic thought reflected some of the headlines we see in the newspaper today, which is kind of crazy to me. So this is cyclical, we know that. And it's, it's and the work that many of y'all do in this room of making sure people understand how free trade is important has to continue. We should have city council people that are outraged because they know how their city is going to be impacted if we mess up NAFTA. We should have governors publicly, not privately, being outraged because the impact that their state's going to have. Um, I have to remind people that yes, even though I have 820 miles of the border, trade is not a border issue. Trade is a US issue, right? Trade is something that impacts everyone. Trade may start in the United States at the border, but it impacts everyone. So all those folks, we have to continue to educate them about the importance of this, and we can't take it for granted. No, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, because y'all all agree on this. But if we're not taking this message out, and we're not encouraging these people that are going to be impacted by this, articulating why it's going to be impacted, then we're going to be in the same damn position that we are today, 10 years from now. Right? So it's, an, it's, a, it's a big task. This is a task that has fallen on people for millennia. And we're the ones that have to rise up and accept that challenge. And I'm glad. There's organizations like the Wilson Center, the Bush Center, NASCO, that are involved in, you know, we have folks like Ambassador Wayne beating the drum, right? And we have smart folks like, like Chris Wilson. So I'm in, you know? So let's, if, if there's something that we can be doing better, um, this is something I, 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 st I will say here, and I'm gonna end with an optimistic uh, point. It's not time to raise a red flag. We should know where the red flag is, maybe even attach it to the flagpole, but it's not time to raise it up. And again, with the work that many of y'all are doing, I think we're going to make sure that NAFTA 2.0 continues to be an example for the rest of the world. So thank you all and God bless you. Will has kindly agreed to take a few friendly questions. Let's start there. Donald Trump, Wilbur Ross, and Ambassador Lighthouse. All right. That was an easy one. Next. Someone, oh, we have a mic. Good. Hold on. Over here. Well, I'm here. Yep. Hi, thank you for your optimistic remarks. I hope you're right. Um, I'm Anna Schneider with Volkswagen Group of America, and we're having a hard time being heard by those three people. Uh, we have Governor Haslam, who's state of Tennessee, where we manufacture. He's coming to Washington. He's certainly carrying our flag, to your point. That made me feel good that we're following the right strategy. Um, members of Congress have written letters to the, uh, the White House, but I, I really don't think anything we say is resonating. I, I welcome your advice on how to be heard. That's why you got to start talking to the markets, right? That's why you got to say, you know, look, I, I know a publicly traded company should not be talking about something that's going to impact their, their bottom line. Um, but you have to talk about the future and one of the concerns that you have with, you know, that could exert significant downward pressures on your stock price is messing up NAFTA. 
um, because nobody in New York City, nobody on Wall Street thinks this is a problem and they are not talking about it. And they're still in this mindset of the conversations prior to the negotiations. And so those conversations have to continue because we have to do two things at the same time. We have to try to influence the NAFTA 2.0 conversations, but we also have to continue to lay the framework to get this done in Congress. We gotta continue to explain and make more people come out publicly in support of this. And many of my political, my friends in the political world don't realize the environment has changed since the election. Right? Um, and and so, so we're still, you know, everybody was nervous in the 16 election about trade. It's like, is this gonna, you know, what are people, how are people gonna respond? Well, that's over and we're in a, we're in a different environment. But the best thing that companies like you can be doing is on those earning calls, talking with folks that monitor the economic health of your company, that they start writing and, and thinking about what would be the long-term impact and understanding that we're, at, we're in a very precarious situation. We can't, the rounds can't slip again. If they slip, we can't get a deal done before the, the elections, before the Mexican elections. And I think everybody would agree that if some of the leading candidates in Mexico get in and you have that as a negotiating tool, then NAFTA is going to get ripped up. Congressman, thanks very much. My name is David Adams from the Global Automakers of Canada. Uh, just a question in terms of this uh, agreement is going to get solved or, or not within America. So what would your recommendations be to folks from Canada, from Mexico, in terms of how to influence the process? Uh, again, um, showing, so, so I, I have, I have the, the example I can use is with Mexico. <clears throat> and I tell this to all of my friends that are um, CEOs of Mexican businesses. Everybody knows what Sara Lee is. Everybody in the United States of America has eaten a tasty treat from Sara Lee. <laughs> Nobody knows that it's owned by Bimbo, right? A, 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 a good Mexican company. And so some of, so, and I would say Mexican and Canadian companies got to raise your head up and be proud of the fact that you're creating jobs in the United States of America. Another example of Rossini is another good uh, Mexican company that is, provide, that is creating thousands of jobs in Michigan, Ohio, and Texas. And those communities don't know that Rossini is a, is a Mexican company. And, and so, look, it's great to have you know, these, this conversation in the New York Times, but we need to have this conversation in the Detroit Free News, in the Amarillo Star, in, 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 those, kinds of, in those kinds of places. And so that's where, where you are big, look at this, what, 36 states where Mexico and Canada is number one and number two trading partner? In those no, states? Point in those states, making sure that people there know that. Yeah. Last yeah. Good morning, uh, Congressman. Uh, my name is Eric Miller, I run a consultancy called Rideau Potomac Strategy Group and a Wilson Fellow. If you play forward a little bit based on what you heard in New York, um, if the administration does initiate the 2205 exit process, say in the March timeframe around which there's been much speculation, how, does the, how do the markets, which have not really priced this in, React. So, so I, I think the, the problem is the markets could react after something is done, and the reaction of the markets, which is the one thing I think can influence um, those three people that are involved in this negotiation, the deal is already done, right? And you can't go back. You know, once that decision is made, it's going to be hard to then try to get them to say, oh, our bad. We're going to zig instead of zag, right? So, so what? So that is that's the that's the dilemma that we're in. Is that real market pressure is only going to come after something bad has happened, and and if, when that thing happens, where the the decision's already made. So how can we get um, you know these forecasters and folks start talking and influencing the process now about how this is 
you know, we, everyone's talking about can the markets get any higher, right? Everybody's going to be excited. Tax reform's going to get done, and we're going to see we're going to see the markets go even further. And everybody's talking about is this is this an overcharged economy, and what brings it down? Well, when people say what brings this down, the next sentence should be screwing up NAFTA. Right? And that's where the influence and the conversations that we're having will get into those right people's minds. All right. Well, Thank you all. Thank you. I, Laura's about to approach, but uh, thanks for the straight talk and the good advice. And I would just point out to folks that I, a few years ago, I had lunch with Gary Doerr, our late great Canadian ambassador to the U.S., and he showed me this computer uh, product that showed all the jobs across the U.S. Uh, that came from trade with Canada. So I said, Gary, I mean, why aren't you spending every waking minute uh, educating Congress about this? Because lots of those jobs were not on the border, in the borders, on the border states. Same is true for Mexico, and same is true for the combination. So it's really important to do the re retail piece to have members of Congress who care or should care about this issue know precisely how many jobs in their districts will be lost if this thing goes south. And it is not that hard to do. It is not that hard to call employees uh, or heads of local companies and have them take their employees with them to a visit to a local office of a member of Congress. Not here, there so that they show up and they say, here I am with the X number of employees, or these people represent the Y number of employees in your district who will be affected by this. And that message is heard, I promise you, I prom but every member of Congress hears that message, because those people are both um, uh, contributors to the local economy, they're also voters, in case you missed that movie. So. Um, just a free suggestion. The Wilson Center, of course, doesn't lobby, but this is a suggestion from a recovering politician. And now please welcome a true expert on this subject, Laura Dawson. Thank you, Jane. Uh, the thing, this is, it's hard to be optimistic about NAFTA right now, but the thing that does make me, give me hope and make, uh, make me optimistic is that we have smart and serious people like Director Harmon, Representative Hurd, taking this issue seriously and, and moving it forward. Now, speaking of smart and serious, look who has joined me here. This is it's my former boss, Matt Rooney. I, I, I was a lowly economic officer, and he was an exalted das. Uh, and what most of you don't know is he speaks beautiful French, and he will tell you he speaks better French than most Canadians. Uh, Matt is also the Director of Economic Growth for the George W. Bush Institute. The Bush Institute has done exemplary work on uh, the nuts and bolts of making this relationship better. Uh, a lot of us talk a good game, but uh, Matt and his team have, have uh, really dug down, and they've got some important news you can use, they've got some important suggestions, and Matt right now has a North American competitiveness scorecard he wants to talk about. So please join me in welcoming Matt Rooney. Well, thank you, Laura, for that absurdly generous introduction, most of which was just fiction. Uh, polite fiction, I like it. Um, but thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here with you all this morning. Thank you, thank you all for coming in so early. It's nice to be, uh, um, as, as a recovering Washingtonian, uh, happily re relocated to Dallas, Texas, it's nice to be back and see a number of, a number of friendly faces. In absentia, let me thank uh, Congressman Hurd for his remarks uh, and for his uh, interest and support uh, for our work over the last um, year or so. He's appeared at a number of events uh, with us and for us and is a great supporter and I think everybody can agree after this morning's performance, a very uh, eloquent uh, producer, uh, a very eloquent supporter of uh, this issue. And uh, also in absentia, thanks to Mrs. Harmon for the partnership uh, with the Wilson Center. Um, it's been a great pleasure working with Laura and Duncan and Lynn and the whole team. Uh, in setting up this event and, and in the past in general, uh, great pleasure. So thank you all for that. Um, my name is Matthew Rooney. I'm the director of the Economic Growth Program at the George W. Bush Institute in Dallas, Texas. Perhaps not a widely known uh, institution inside the Beltway. Uh, we are a component of the George W. Bush Presidential Center. 
uh, which was founded by President and Mrs. Bush when they left the White House in the beginning of 2009. Uh, I encourage you to visit us in Dallas. We have a beautiful uh, museum and display space that uh, looks at the President's time in office. Uh, we're also the home of the President's uh, archive. Uh, we have a very nice restaurant. We have an interesting gift shop, and we have a policy institute. Um, and the policy institute, we, we conceive of it as not just a think tank, but also a do tank. Uh, and we have a number of issue areas that we work on, uh, issues that were near and dear to the President and Mrs. Bush's hearts when they were in public life and that they wanted to follow up on in retirement. Uh, so we have a very big program on military service, which is focused on uh, assisting with the transition from military life to civilian life. Uh, to addressing the invisible wounds. Uh, we have a very broad uh, initiative on education reform, which is focused on uh, improving the uh, leadership skills of school districts and school principals across the United States. We have a program that promotes um, in, uh, political engagement among young people in emerging <coughs> democracies like Burma. We have a program that promotes engagement in politics and leadership by women in the Middle East, North Africa, and Afghanistan. And we have my program, Economic Growth. And in the, in the years that I've been involved, uh, and the reason actually that uh, President Bush uh, invited me to come to Dallas and, and uh, take on the program was that he already, three years ago now, wanted to focus on North America and felt that uh, there was a job of work to be done in improving public understanding in the United States in particular of NAFTA. At that time, we were still trying to avoid saying the word NAFTA. Uh, and we, we studiously said North America, but let's face it, we were talking about NAFTA. And we wanted to improve the public perception and understanding of what NAFTA had accomplished uh, and, and what uh, it had actually, the opportunities it had created for the United States. So I'm displaying here the Bush Center website. I encourage you to, uh, to visit it, have a look at our work. Um, and, uh, and if you're of a mind to do so, sign up for our digital publications. We have a number of periodicals, weekly, bi-weekly, and quarterly that we hope you'll find interesting and useful. Um, we also have our focus on North America. Uh, we have made a set of uh, recommendations about how North American competitiveness can be improved. You'll find those on the website. And we have uh, looked at North American competitiveness on a number of dimensions. And what we did here was we took measures of competitiveness and economic freedom and economic openness prepared by others, so the World Bank, the World Economic Forum, uh, the Heritage Foundation, a group in Canada called the Fraser Institute. Uh, Fraser has a very interesting index of economic freedom, which has a number of benefits from our point of view. One, it amplifies that set of uh, policy focal points. Two, it is actually authored and curated and prepared by a professor at Southern Methodist University. Uh, and so that professor, Bob Lawson, was instrumental in helping us get our scorecard up and running uh, just about two years ago now. So what we do is we look here, we, we took those four databases and we created them into a single unified database that covers 101 countries going back now 11 years. Um, and we, we broke down that database on uh, a number of dimensions of com that we felt were useful for uh, understanding competitiveness. And we then uh, group those scores together by trading group, and we assign trading groups around the world a score. So we look at North America. We find that North America rates a B plus uh, uh, on our dimension. And in fact, you can look here. You can go back those 11 years. Uh, and one thing you find is that North America's score is declining over time. That's, a, that's not a relative score. It's, kind of a, it's a percentile score based on the ratings of nor the North American countries uh, on, on those dimensions of competitiveness. Those, those four databases represent almost 300 dimensions of competitiveness, so it goes down into quite a level of detail. Um, uh, and we ca you can look, uh, if you have a mind to, at the reasons for the decline in North America's score. Um, the main, one of the main reasons that's apparent here uh, on this measure is that our macroeconomic environment is declining. That is mostly uh, about the accumulation of public debt in the United States uh, and the sustained deficit spending, which is slowly undermining um, the macroeconomic stability of the zone. If we look at other trading groups, you can look here at the European Union. We find the European Union gets a B. Uh, we find the APEC group gets a B. The interesting thing about the APEC group score is that all three of the North American countries are members of APEC. 
Uh, and so if you recalculate APEX score without the North American group in them, the APEX score actually drops dramatically to a C or a C minus. Uh, and the reason for that is, is essentially um, China. So we look at a couple of other trading groups, the TPP group, uh, for just for old time's sake. Uh, <laughs> and the, uh, th we also look at uh, RCEP, um, the, the Chinese-led uh, trade group in Asia. Uh, and we look at TPP, uh, sorry, uh, Pacific Alliance, uh, which we think is an interesting phenomenon uh, in, in Latin America. So these, these scores are, uh, we think, a useful contribution to the discussion about North America, the fact that North America is the most competitive among the major trading groups, uh, particularly benchmark against the EU, which is the most closely comparable uh, to the North American group in terms of the size of the economy, the size of the population. Uh, we think and hope that this is a useful contribution to the NAFTA discussion. We have a little bit of ambition to go uh, to offer um, still more value, and so we also let you look as a user of the website at the country scores. You can look at individual countries, um, and the site will generate a little scorecard for you. You can look at that going back uh, those 11 years. Um, one thing that jumps off the page uh, when you look at the countries, if you look at the three countries in North America, you can see that uh, Mexico, uh, sorry, United States and Canada uh, score quite high. Mexico scores relatively uh, lower. That's essentially um, rule of law and institutional integrity issues in Mexico, which I think are widely known and, and widely acknowledged. I'm certainly not criticizing Mexico when we say that. But when you look at that, um, one of the things that concerned me when we, when we went down this road is that the North America score then appears to be brought down by that association with Mexico. Uh, we don't think that's a fair way to think of it. And so we wanted to look a step deeper and, in fact, um, uh, consider the possibility, at least, that uh, the high score that's earned by the United States on this, on this uh, country measure is actually partially because of the relationship with Mexico. Uh, and so we do look a level deeper at the economic integration process. Uh, and we look here at a comparison between North America, the EU, and APEC in terms of their economic integration. Uh, and we define that to mean evolution of trade within the group and the impacts on growth, job creation, and global trade of the group um, over time. And so, uh, for example, if you look here at APEC, we have a nice flashy little flourish there. Um, uh, on the left-hand chart, you can see uh, the trade within the APEC group since 1990. On the right-hand chart, you can see the APEC trade with the rest of the world uh, broken down by country. So this, this large chunk up here is China. This large chunk down here is the United States. Um, and you can see that as trade among the APEC countries has grown since 1990, APEC trade with the rest of the world has grown, roughly in lockstep with APEC trade among itself. You can look at different dimensions here, so you can compare excuse me, trade uh, within the APEC group to APEC's GDP. You can see that uh, China's GDP here has grown fairly dramatically over that period. Um, Japan's GDP is here, has grown some. Uh, the United States GDP has grown uh, quite strongly during that same period. Um, we look at total employment. You can see that total employment in the APEC group has grown a little. Uh, but it is broadly stable. Other dimensions here, the, the, to the extent that we had data, we're, we let you play with. We let you play with that. We hope, as again, this is a useful tool, not just for thinking about NAFTA, but for thinking about economic integration. If we look at the EU, um, you can see here that uh, the EU's trade within itself has grown fairly strongly, particularly starting in 2000. And EU trade with the rest of the world has also grown uh, quite strongly with the uh, starting again in 2000. You can look at GDP. Interestingly, the GDP of the European group uh, has grown uh, some, um, not terribly dramatically, and uh, job creation has been essentially flat uh, in the EU, EU group since 1990. So we can look at North America. Um, we'll start with the. So we, so we look here at total employment. I think this is a very important and a very interesting chart. You can see on the left-hand chart as trade among the North American group has grown fairly dramatically from about $500 billion a year to, uh, what is that, $1.5 trillion a year, so around a trillion dollar a year increase. Um, all three countries have grown employment significantly. If you look across here, 
U.S. employment in 1990 was just shy of 120 million. In um, 2016, 151 million, that's a 30 million increase, or around 25%. Uh, employment in Mexico has likewise grown from just shy of 30 million uh, to um, just over 50 million, so a significant increase in Mexico and a strong increase in Canada as well. Each, each of the three countries has, has grown employment by around 30% since NAFTA was signed. Uh, we look at GDP. Uh, GDP growth has been quite strong as North American, as intra-North American trade has increased. Uh, gross domestic product of all three NAFTA countries, particularly the United States, has grown quite strongly. Um, and then we look finally at world trade and the thing that jumps off this chart to me, these are the same data points on the left-hand chart, a different, slightly different scale. Uh, so the trade within North America looks less, uh, but it's the same numbers. Um, you can see that trade, North America's trade with the rest of the world has in fact grown quite dramatically uh, since 1990. And US trade in particular with the rest of the world has grown quite dramatically since 1990. So the conclusion that we draw from this set of data is the competitiveness is important, uh, the integration process is important, and the integration process actually uh, has functioned as intended. It has been a stimulus to innovation, it's been a stimulus to growth across the board in employment, in GDP, and in global trade. Uh, and, and without going so far as to assert, to confuse correlation with causation, um, I think in the very least you can't look at this correlation and see a failure by the United States. You can't see the United States um, being pushed out of world markets. You can't see the United States failing to employ its people. You can't see the United States economy failing to grow. So um, we think it's a fairly persuasive presentation. We hope you'll agree. Uh, we hope you'll have a look uh, and, and tell us what you think. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of work that colleagues here have done um, to explain our uh, uh, our analysis of the data. Uh, we encourage you to look at it, and we also encourage you to look at the data itself. Uh, there, is a, there is a link, um, if I can find it. This explains our approach to analyzing the data and to establishing the scores. And down here at the very bottom, there is a link. You can download the two spreadsheets that underlie the data and play with them yourself and reach your own conclusions, and we'd be very uh, interested and curious to hear what conclusions you come to and uh, hope you'll find the tool useful. We think it's a useful contribution to the discussion that's taking place over what to do about NAFTA. We think it suggests that do no harm is a minimum, <laughs> minimum standard. Uh, and in fact, there are opportunities for additional competitiveness, additional global competitiveness uh, in the way NAFTA is structured and in the way the three countries interact. We think it's, uh, it's an opportunity. We have an opportunity to seize those possibilities and, and build on that uh, competitiveness and we hope we, we hope all three governments will take it. So I'm very grateful for your attention uh, this morning. I hope you find the tool interesting and useful. Are we taking questions? Uh, I think we're going to just move into the next program. Move on. Okay. But, but while we do this, please repeat for us, what is the URL for this program? Hey, that's a great point and I should have said that up front, so thank you for asking that question. Uh, so you'll find it at bushcenter.org. Uh, and if you want to go straight to our scorecard, bushcenter.org slash uh, scorecard will take you straight, straight to it. Uh, and I'm going to be checking the traffic numbers, and I look forward to seeing a spike after today's presentation. So you heard it here, bushcenter.org slash scorecard. Yeah. Please join me in thanking that group. Thanks, Matt. We actually could have taken a whole morning to go over that uh, really rigorous and important bit of research that the Bush Center has done. So please do take the time to, uh, to review the scorecard, uh, to look at the website, and then send all your questions directly to Matt Rooney. <laughs> um, in addition to Ben's many skills as, a, as an economist with a master's degree in economics, he is also extremely gifted at furniture moving. Uh, ben Proctor is the uh, program associate at the Canada Institute. He is a favorite son of Saskatchewan, and he's good with a podium. Uh, <laughs> and, and now the, the rest of the team is, uh, is doing the dance behind me to organize the chairs and uh, uh, get rid of the cables for our uh, uh, next part of the program which is a conversation with a learned panel 
moderated by an even more learned guy who, wait for it, is a former employer of Laura Dawson. You see there is a trend here. <laughs> Ambassador David Wilkins uh, is, uh, is a partner at Nelson Mullins Law Firm. Uh, he was also one of, if I can say, one of the greatest uh, U.S. ambassadors to Canada. He was great for the relationship. He was great for, for advancing Canada-U.S. relations. As a staff member, he was also great for calling a snow day. If you live in Ottawa, you got want a guy from South Carolina deciding whether it's safe to drive. <laughs> Uh, or, or not. Uh, he, uh, uh, he continues to be an important uh, spokesperson and advocate for the relationship. And so now that my dancing and singing is done and my team has got the chairs, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Ambassador Wilkins. Welcome. Thank you very much. Up, guys. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being with us. Um, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be on this panel and uh, to be a moderator. Uh, I want to thank the Woodrow Wilson Center for scholars, especially the Canada and Mexican Institutes, for sponsoring uh, this event and making it possible. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with, with Laura and Tiffany uh, and Duncan to discuss NAFTA negotiations and the implications on the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. And, uh, all of you know Laura, or many of you know Laura and Tiffany and, and Duncan. They're well-known and established thought leaders in North America. Uh, Laura, of course, the director of the Canada Institute here and uh, brings a unique uh, background as an accomplished academic analyst uh, to the North America project, and she's an experienced policymaker uh, in this area. Tiffany uh, brings a grassroots, outside the Beltway perspective to our long-time and informed commitment to North America. She runs NASCO, the North American Strategy for Competitiveness, which is a tri-national membership organization focusing on the North American supply chain and skilled workforce initiatives. And Duncan is director of the Mex Mexico Institute at the Wilson Center. And with his British roots, Canadian education, uh, Mexican academic career, and American think tank experience, he embodies the NAFTA experience. Uh, so we have... Uh, Real expertise on this panel for a delightful discussion. Uh, all I have to do is not get in the way, and I don't plan to do that. Uh, <clears throat> I do have to say, as uh, Matt wrote it, uh, I was honored to serve as President Bush's ambassador uh, to Canada. I was delighted when he asked me to chair the Bush Institute North America Competitors Working Group two years ago. If I don't say this, I won't get invited back. Um, about a year ago, that group produced a series of recommendations for strengthening our North American trade and investment relations in order to boost global competitiveness of the United States and our neighbors. Um, so, given the ongoing NAFTA talks, uh, we thought it would be useful to convene today's discussion uh, with NAFTA negotiators back in D.C. Uh, for, for discussions. Our timing couldn't be better. Uh, so with all that in mind, let's get right to our all-star uh, panel. Uh, Duncan, I'll start with you and then... Uh, Laura, same question. Um, with NAFTA being debated in the United States in 1993, critics said it would lead to massive job losses. Proponents said it would strengthen America's competitiveness and lead to reduce immigration from Mexico. In your opinion, what were the three countries' goals in negotiating NAFTA? And most importantly, has the agreement performed as hoped and promised? Thank you, Ambassador, and thank you, everybody, for, uh, for being here. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, also, of course, recognize uh, Ambassador Tony Wayne, who's here with us, and, uh, and Gil Roshinsky. It's great to see you again. Also a, a NAFTA crusader in your, in your time. Uh, a couple of our board members are here as well, uh, Ryan Hill, Diana Negroponte. Great to have you. Um, and just one very brief point for, for Matt. I wonder what would happen to those NAFTA figures on trade with the rest of the world if you passed out China because I noticed that there was that dramatic rise there. And then you passed it out between the three countries as well. Of course, you'd see that the United States trade with China is sort of one of the, one of the biggest components there. And I think it would be interesting to show that in a graphic in the future, just to show how NAFTA has actually done quite well compared to trade with the rest of the world if you take out the China component. But anyway, 
Um, to, get to, to get to your question, uh, the original motivations, let, let me begin with, uh, with Mexico. Um, because, you know, if we go back to that period in the late 1980s, uh, Mexico was looking at the world um, and looking internally. And in the world, it saw that there was a very, very complicated uh, situation with the, uh, with the GATT. The Uruguay round was in deep trouble. Um, the European experiment was getting deeper and deeper and closer to the single market of 1992. And like many people around the world, they said, well, we need to have a, a regional option. Internally, of course, they were looking at the experience of the Latin American, or in this particular, the Mexican debt crisis, the transformation in Mexican economic policy that was underway, the rise of the technocrats, and the opening of Mexico to the world. And more than anything else, what Mexico wanted was to lock in the economic liberalization that was taking place in this country at the time. And rather than passing sweeping legislation, at the domestic level, which was more or less politically impossible at the time, they decided to go the international route. So an outside-in approach to make sure that Mexico remained committed to open markets. And what's extraordinary about that I experiment is that it was so successful, because Mexico, from being a country which was certainly skeptical of openness in the 1980s, um, certainly had a long tradition, a long history of being closed. Remember that even in the early 1980s, uh, prices of, of everyday goods were set on a weekly basis, in some cases a daily basis in Mexico, by a government panel. Today, Mexico has become one of the great free trade champions, has free trade agreements with more countries than anybody else in the, in, in, in the world. And in fact, this has even been raised as a point, as a bone of contention by the US government saying that when we negotiated the NAFTA with Mexico, they didn't have all these free trade agreements. It's not fair that they've gone out and signed all these other free trade agreements. And you have to say, well, maybe you should do the same thing. Maybe that's what, how the world actually works. Now, from the point of view of the United States, I, I see it as being uh, a situation where uh, you know, the, uh, the, the US government was looking at what was happening in the GATT, the problems of the Uruguay round and saying that as much as anything else, we need to have this regional option as a way of uh, gaining leverage in our global negotiations. And I think it was ultimately successful. There were lots of other factors in the ultimate success of the, uh, of the Uruguay round, but that to me was a turning point. And of course for Canada, I, I hate to speak in the presence of such, uh, such wisdom in this room, but uh, you know, Canada's position as much as anything was defensive in the sense that it was uh, seeing that Mexico had taken a little bit of the initiative here with the United States, wanted to lock in their own gains. Um, but ultimately, I think Canada became converted to the, uh, to, to the benefits of having Mexico as part of the team. And at first, I, I have to say, I mean, I studied US, sorry, uh, Canada-Mexico relations for 17 years when I lived in Mexico. And much of the time, I found that there was more rhetoric than actual real substance. And at, at times, that was, that was frustrating. Today, I think we can find that there is a really important and substantive bilateral relationship between Mexico and Canada, even beyond just the immediate uh, context of the NAFTA negotiations and the partnership that has been formed there. Laura, your thoughts? Sure. Um, the, the Na Canada was a reluctant uh, uh, convert to the NAFTA. The real deal for Canada was the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement of 1989. Canada came to that slowly over, oh, I don't know, 100 years or so, maybe even sooner. I mean, no truck or trade with the Yankees is something every Canadian school child has in their history book. Um, and so it was a really big leap of faith for Canada to make the transition to a free trade arrangement with its, uh, with its North American partner. Because as you know, Canada with uh, you know, second largest land mass in the world, 34 million people, um, had to make some decisions economically about how it would produce and develop. And, and the primary decision was high tariff walls in order to encourage U.S. branch plants to jump those walls and locate uh, in Canada. So the big Canadian companies when I was a kid were GE of Canada, GM of Canada, Ford of Canada, Kraft of Canada. You know, there's, there's, a, 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 there's a trend here. And so when it came to uh, adjusting to a new globalized economy, Canada had to make the jump and say, we need to figure out what we do well, where we can compete globally with the rest of the world, and in particular in the United States, and we're gonna ha have to let the rest of this stuff fall by the wayside and see what happens when those tariff walls go down. 
And so the same kinds of transitions and challenges that we hear about uh, the United States going through now, Canada actually went through very early in terms of uh, uh, reindustrialization, changing manufacturing patterns. Uh, so once it had the deal with the United States, that was enough uh, adjustment, enough change. Thank you very much. It was one of the first comprehensive free trade agreements in the world. So there was a lot of learning and growing to do. So when, when Mexico came on board, it was like, well, we have, to, uh, we have to include Mexico in our, quote, special relationship with the United, with the United States or we're going to be, end up in this hub and spoke arrangement and Canadian interests will be diluted and diversified. So we better jump on this train. We're not really sure why we're doing it. Flash forward now uh, a, a couple of decades and you've got a much more robust relationship between Canada and Mexico. You don't see huge uh, uh, Canada-Mexico bilateral trade, but a lot of trade is, is mediated through the, the you know, big bright light in between the two countries. So uh, the, the notion that Canada, US, Mexico build things together is very much the case. We are able to retain high skilled technology jobs in auto parts design in Guelph, Ontario because there are really skilled tool and die makers in Mexico and willing markets and buyers in the United States. And that's the virtuous circle we were hoping for. Now we're in this situation where Canadians are going, WTF? You know, we did everything right. We made the commitment to North American supply chains and we made the commitment to building things together. We have, you know, tried to play by the rules and being good Canadians. We know we don't violate them very often unless you're talking about softwood and other stuff. Um, <laughs> And, and all of a sudden, the fundamental basis of Canadian commercial policy and industrial organization is being threatened, and people in this town don't seem to care. Canada is doing a pretty good job in diversifying its trade to other countries, but still, when 70% of Canadian, 75% of Canadian exports go to the United States, 20% of Canadian GDP relies on that relationship, you just can't flip a switch and be uh, primary traders with European Union or China. It takes some time. So Canadians are very worried about what's going on in this town. Thank you. Tiffany, in these uh, polarized days, it seems like there's one issue in the U.S. that actually uh, unite some members of the political left and uh, political right, and that's the opposition to NAFTA. Uh, they both point to issues including lost jobs and wages. As a defender of NAFTA, what do you say to that? Well, there's a lot to say. Um, so NAFTA has been, you know, when you look at all the data, the statistics out there, it's been a resounding success for, for all three countries. Um, no agreement is perfect, so there have been some very few, much fewer than I think you see in the media or that you used to see in the media when this first started. You don't see a lot in the media about NAFTA anymore these days, but, um, uh, and I mean just in recent times as far as mainstream media. But the job losses are primarily due to advances in manufacturing and advances in te technology innovation um, and our workers not keeping up with the training necessary to be able to fill those positions. So. There are actually much fewer jobs lost as a direct result of NAFTA than people might think. This people being out in the grassroots area that are maybe possibly less informed about uh, the actual impacts of NAFTA. But um, trade between all three countries has grown, it's quadrupled since NAFTA was put into effect. It's now at $1.3 trillion a year. And to break that down for you, that's $3.3 billion a day and $100 million an hour. So just as we've been sitting here, $100 million worth of trade between our three nations has, has taken place. Um, 14 million jobs in the United States uh, depend on trade with Mexico and Canada. Um, the supply chains are fully integrated, and there's more work that could be done there, but they've been integrated very effectively. We make things together now. Um, there's been a lot of foreign direct investment in all three countries, but to bring it to the U.S., there's $285 billion, I think is the most recent number of foreign direct investment from Mexico and Canada to the United States. Um, so NAFTA has been a resounding success. 
and jobs have been created, jobs have been retained. People don't talk necessarily so much about the job retention numbers. Uh, you hear about jobs lost, but if, if you know, but for NAFTA and the ability to kind of diversify your companies into Mexico and Canada, they could have picked up and moved everything to China. So the fact that they were able to go to Mexico and Canada could cut their costs and keep the jobs open in the United States. And I'm not sure I've even, even ever heard an exact number of the jobs retained by NAFTA that were not lost to China. So NAFTA has been a huge success. And if I could take a couple moments, just because I am kind of coming from the grassroots area, um, you know, Congressman Hurd was talking about, you know, talk to the markets, get, get on those earnings calls, tell them about your fears about NAFTA and what that could do to your earning potential. Um, and like Ambassador Wilkins just mentioned, out at the grassroots level, I mean, you do have major urban areas. You have a lot of support for NAFTA, and more so than when this conversation began when Trump was elected. Uh, but you still have a lot of naysayers, and the statistics that I just rattled off, and there's plenty more where those came from, don't really matter anymore. It's not a fact-based argument. It's very emotional. Um, and I feel like a lot of it in the grassroots area, my, my organization has been working for 20 years at trying to educate people about the importance and the opportunity to work with North Americans. Um, and we're, when we have meetings, when we put things in the press, you know, the people that read the stuff, the people that attend the meetings are already kind of drinking the juice. They get it or else they're interested in learning more, but they're not the naysayers. It's hard to get the naysayers to read or come to anything that, where they might have an opportunity to change their mind. Um, and as an example, I mean, so you're talking about, I think uh, it was Congressman Hurd that was talking about get, you know, the Amarillo paper, the, you know, the rural, pa the, the, the grassroots papers to write more about this. They write them occasionally, but just in the airport yesterday, like I was walking by and I had a bunch of papers I was going to read on the plane. And I see that Kim Kardashian, her <laughs> surrogate, um, they had a huge fight in the hospital room when the baby was born. And she was leaving the hospital with this horrific look on her face, blanketing her baby. And... I was thinking, oh my God, I've got a Lord for you, but that looks like a good story. That <laughs> looks like a good story. Maybe I should take 20 minutes and buy this magazine and skim it and postpone my work a little bit. But I didn't. Luckily, I did my work. But what I'm saying is that it's hard to compete with stuff like that. It's hard to compete with maybe Meghan Markle is already pregnant, and that's why Harry proposed to her. And when you get out, when you get out, yeah, is it true? It's Duncan says it's true. I can't believe that. She seems like such a nice girl, right? But when you're competing with this kind of stuff, and try and then, like if People Magazine ran a cover of, you know, NAFTA, it actually worked. You know, people would be like, eh, I'm going to pass on that. You know, People's sales would plummet that, you know, that two-week period or whatever. So we've got a lot of work to do. And we've been out there banging the pavement for so long, talking about, look, people, everything that you touch, see, eat, smell, use all day long got there on a truck, a train, a ship, or a plane. And the cost of goods in the marketplace are based on freight costs, logistics costs, fuel costs, insurance premiums. But we have done a really bad job in the United States of educating people, and I think it's a little bit too late now. And what I, what I hope, well, I don't hope for a withdrawal, but I think our only hope now to get to those people that completely say, nope, my uncle lost his job, my aunt lost her job because of NAFTA, I'm not buying it, or there's a whole Mexican illegal immigration thing out at the grassroots level. I feel like in D.C. you guys are very informed, but like out there there's a lot of confusion between, they think NAFTA, NAFTA lost jobs to Mexico. You don't hear anyone complaining about lost jobs to Canada, really. They lost jobs to Mexico. The Mexicans are coming in here illegally. They're not anymore, but they still think they are. They're taking our jobs. You know, all this, it's, it's a massive misinformation campaign. And so, and, and they are dead, you know, dead solid on these points. You can't convince them otherwise. And so I feel like no matter what happens with NAFTA, if we have a withdrawal, we need to get to those grocery store chains and the owners and put little signs. This food is from Mexico. This food is from Canada. Your clothes are from Mexico and Canada. Like, do a better job of educating people about how the cost of goods um, are affected. And so I think the cost of goods will go up, obviously, withdraw from NAFTA. But we may have to go through a bit of pain and educating. And if we stay in NAFTA, we have to do an equally solid job of re-educating people so that if we do have some sort of a provision in there where there's a five-year review or something, that we're ready for it in five years so that we don't have to go through this hassle again. Thank you. Uh, Laura and Duncan, uh, are Mexico and Canada coordinating their approaches? It seems they are to some extent. Uh, what are the limits to their cooperation and at what point does one desert the other in order to cut a deal with the United States? Oh, man, the throw Mexico under the bus question. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, Matt's the one that wrote it. <laughs> you, 
<laughs> you, you wrote the bus question, Matt. Um, there was a little bit of complacence in Canada with respect to the Canada-US free trade agreement because a lot of people were saying, well, you know, that NAFTA disappears and we have this perfectly good bilateral relationship lying underneath it that we can dust off and it will be great and that special relationship is restored and those Mexicans aren't here anymore, na 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 na, -na. But it turns out that the Canada-US free trade agreement is actually a very flawed and incomplete agreement. A lot of things in that legal text uh, were uh, had to be repaired in the NAFTA, so it would be a very uh, foolhardy to rely on that as the basis for Canada's largest trading relationship. And it lacks things like services, rules of origin, uh, most elements of dispute settlement. So not a good thing to rely on to begin with. But secondly, uh, Canadians are understanding the importance of 127.5 million Mexicans as a potential market. Um, the Harper government had a notoriously bad relationship with Mexico. The, Harper, the Trudeau government has been eager to restore and revive that relationship relationship. Uh, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, uh, Minister Freeland have been down to Mexico. Uh, they like the photo opportunities and they like being, a, you know, the good guys in the hemisphere. Um, so that's, that's an image that looks good for Canada, which also has substance behind it. And in terms of substance, Canada and Mexico have been talking about uh, joint positions on issues. Canada has committed to stay in the NAFTA because there are things in Mexico's domestic commercial policy that require the continuation of that legal text. Duncan will understand this. I don't. Um, so, so that's one element. But in terms of the issues, they are generally aligned. I understand that there are differences in importance. Uh, clearly, Mexico is not going to go to bat uh, for retaining Canadian supply-managed dairy policies, but they're probably not going to take an antagonistic position either. So Mexico and Canada are, I think, as strong as they can be at this point in the negotiations. Duncan? Yeah, I, I, so being a Brit, I can never miss an opportunity to quote Rudyard Kipling. And uh, you know, the, 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 yeah, the poem, If, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, that very much encapsulates what I think both Canada and Mexico are experiencing in this, uh, in this negotiation. Um, and it has generated a, uh, a cooperative, collaborative spirit between the two countries, which I find to be quite remarkable. Uh, and, I, and I think that the best example of it is what we saw in the recent TPP-11 uh, negotiations, um, where Canada wa was under enormous pressure to sign on an agreement, and for domestic reasons could not do so, and appealed to Mexico to back them up. And speaking to Mexican officials, they said this was one of the most difficult things that we've had to do recently because we very much want to see that go ahead. We want things to progress, and we don't necessarily agree with the Canadian position, but we agreed to back them up because it's important at times like this. That kind of solidarity, I think, is something which goes an enormously long way. There's another example, of course, the fact that both countries have said, we are not going to walk away from the table, unless, of course, termination is made a reality, then if that's a, uh, that's a negotiating tactic on the part of the United States, we're willing, we're willing to walk away. So I think that we're seeing a, an extraordinary um, collaborative spirit, a kind of a solidarity between the two countries. And as much as anything, I think it's based upon this idea that we are free trading nations and we're sitting across the table from negotiators who are not free traders, negotiating the future of a free trade agreement. And so there is this um, conceptual gap between the two sides. Mexico and Canada are firmly on one, and they're able to understand each other. And they're trying to find ways in which they can use those shared, uh, that shared world vision um, to greater effect against the team on the other side. So I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that that's going to be effective in the long term. I'm not saying it's going to be successful. But I think it is incredible how these two countries have actually come together and the negotiating teams have an understanding which is really remarkable. Thank you. It, it seems like some minor progress is made, but it also appears that there seems to be a, a risk at least of deadlock over U.S. proposals uh, on auto content, dispute settlement, and a sunset clause. Uh, Tiffany, let me ask you, uh, what do you think the U.S. needs in order to conclude a successful negotiation? <laughs> I drew the short straw, I guess. Um, 
I can, I can think of a few different uh, bitingly sarcastic answers to that question about what the U.S. needs, but I will uh, filter myself. Um, I think that the U.S. needs uh, major concessions on the part of Canada and Mexico uh, to some of the uh, provisions they've introduced. And there's a couple different trains of thought out there. You heard Congressman Hurd say that um, he believes those are negotiating starting points. Um, and there's a, a lot of people that think that, that they're extreme negotiating starting points and that they will, they are willing to come off of those a bit, but they want to get a counter from Mexico or Canada first. And you've heard uh, Lighthizer talk about how he's astounded that Canada and Mexico have not come to the table with counter proposals. Um, but then you take the Canada and Mexico point, which is that why would we come with a counter proposal that's doing harm to all three of our nations? So it's my understanding, and these guys may be better equipped with the latest, but uh, that there's no intention on the part of Canada or Mexico to come back with a counterproposal, let's say, for the rules of origin, because they feel like that's going the wrong direction, it's fine now. Um, so then there's another train of thought, which is that these are so-called poisonous pills, that the Trump administration has gone so extreme with their proposals that they know that Canada and Mexico won't come back to the table with anything, they'd be unable to, and therefore they would have an excuse to withdraw from the NAFTA negotiations. And honestly, um, there's, there's a lot of people, very, very well-respected people that I turn to for lots of advice and do lots of reading and, and do the, reading, the writing themselves that, that disagree on that. Some say it's a negotiating tactic, some say it's a, it's a reason to withdraw. But either way, I think um, they're going to have to see Canada and Mexico come back, come back with something. I think some provisions that they've introduced, like the sunset clause, it would be automatically automatic termination. Uh, unless all three parties agree to move forward. There might be some wiggle room there as on the part of Canada and Mexico to possibly say, well, we can do a five-year review, but it's not going to trigger automatic termination. So I think there are some ways that the U.S. might be willing to come off of their hard positions um, on some things, but I think they're going to need to get enough major concessions on the part of Canada and Mexico to call it a win, unless someone can come up with some other way to call it a win for them. Okay. Um, so I think it's a tough, a tough position for Canada and Mexico to be in, and a tough position for all of us to be in, um, but I don't think they're, they're just going to, you know, come meet Canada and Mexico halfway on this stuff. I feel like they're going to really expect uh, to walk away with something around what they have introduced, and I think some of those are unacceptable, too. Well, thank you. Uh, Duckett, Laura, any thoughts? Just, I mean, very quickly, on the, on the sunset clause, I think that there's, um, there's, there's a certain amount of optimism in Mexico that their counterproposal of the review was well-received, mm -hmm. um, and it suggests that there is room for maneuver and there is a certain degree of flexibility on the US side and there's an expectation that that flexibility will increase as time goes on. And that takes me to a, to a second point, which is that um, this week is extraordinarily important for the negotiations because it's mid-level negotiators who are coming together on all of the different teams. And it's a lot of the stuff that all three sides agree upon. And there's a feeling in Mexico that if we can make progress on the, the nitty gritty, the sort of the, you know, the, the, the really down in the weed stuff, that we can generate a sense of momentum so that when we come back in January in Montreal, that we can actually sit down and we say, okay, we've still got these huge issues that divide us, but do we really want to sacrifice all the other stuff that we've got done? And the history of trade negotiations suggests that's far from a given, but I think that there is, there is reason to be optimistic. And, and just, just one other the small point. Um, Secretary Guajardo from, uh, from Mexico um, has suggested that he's willing to be flexible on the rules of origin for automobiles, but not on a national content element. And, and once again, that takes us back to the belief in free trade and that this is something that you would not find in any other free trade deal around the world. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, we've got these four or five issues which are antithetical to uh, uh, a free trade agreement, liberalized open markets. Uh, and I think there's been uh, a certain amount of resistance and surprise from, from Canada and Mexico saying, you know, how do we do this? How do we jump halfway off the cliff instead of all the way off the cliff? Um, but I, I, I don't think that any of the other parties have been completely resistant. Canada on rules of origin has said, we don't buy the proposal that you're putting forward right now, but why don't we all sit down and talk to the automakers and craft from scratch um, an effective 
effective North American um, uh, auto regime that takes into account the new realities of the sector. We're, we're good with that. Um, but there's these, you know, there's these four or five deals, or four or five issues, and we're just not sure whether are we supposed to talk the United States down out of the trees on the on these ones? Um, are we supposed to uh, to come up with a more moderate position? Um, I, I think the real tragedy here is that there's 20 other issues or so that are very productive, that are very important, that a lot of them are brought over from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, they make good sense, the three parties have already largely agreed to these principles, and things like borders and regulatory and digital modernization, uh, agriculture, sanitary, phytosanitary measures actually mean more dollar for dollar than um, the, the poison pill proposals that uh, that we uh, we see up on offer. And, and some of the things, again, strain could if Canada does not believe in the fundamental premise of trade deficits, how do you talk the United States into a different position that provides a win on something you really don't believe with in to begin with? Thank you. Presidential elections next year in Mexico, midterms in the U.S. next year. Uh, what are the implications of these political timelines for NAFTA negotiations? Open to all three of you. Mexico. Um, the waters are rather muddy um, when it comes to the impact of the NAFTA negotiations on Mexico's electoral process. Um, certainly, uh, people of all political persuasions in Mexico um, are uh, more anti-American than they were a year ago. Um, a recent paper that was published uh, by, by my colleague Chris Wilson highlights a lot of these numbers. Um, and he draws on data that's been produced by a number of different uh, polling firms and, and other think tanks to show this. Um, but there is a space there suggesting that if all Mexicans, of, of no matter what political persuasion, if all Mexicans are more strongly anti-American, then the candidate who is most anti-American may be able to drag in some of the independents. My experience with Mexico is that they tend to vote not on foreign policy, not on international affairs and not on the relationship with the United States. They tend to vote on domestic issues. And I think that 2018 is going to be exactly about that. So the question then becomes, suppose that we get a president elected in Mexico in July who takes office in December of next year who is anti-American. Uh, Andres Manuel López Obrador, who uh, gave a, uh, a presentation here at the Wilson Center not so long ago, outlined his views that whilst NAFTA has probably been good for Mexico. It needs to be modernized, and he's the man to negotiate. Um, he's also uh, identified that he wants Mexico to be independent in food production. Now, you think about the importance of U.S. agricultural exports to Mexico, that would be hugely contentious. So I, I think that if you do have an Andres Manuel presidency, then I think it obviously will impact upon NAFTA negotiations if they go beyond the July stroke December uh, point. Um, and certainly bilateral economic relations will become a lot more complex. Yeah, I, I think um, the, the negotiating parties, the, at least Canada and Mexico, um, have, have recognized, as, as Duncan has said, if, if, anyone, if they leave the table, they are not going to be invited back because uh, this is, uh, they're negotiating with a party who fundamentally does not want to do a free trade agreement. Um, and I, so I think that Canada intends to stay at the table for as long as possible, lay as much track on productive uh, areas uh, that they can negotiate on, uh, and then it becomes a fundamentally political and politicized process. Now, Ambassador Wilkins, if I needed political analysis, I would be asking you. We're going in the wrong direction. Um, um, Duncan has already outlined the, the Mexico, but I think in terms of, of U.S., uh, Bob Zellick was here a few weeks ago. He, it, in his estimation, the, um, there are still enough pro-trade votes uh, in, in major uh, congressional committees to, uh, to retain, preserve, save the NAFTA. But what happens after we get into primary season uh, if we end up in a situation where uh, where moderate Republicans become extreme Republicans and moderate Democrats become extreme Democrats, both of those factions join hands to become anti-traders. So we could end up in a very difficult situation. Uh, what I predict is we're going to end up with, uh, with a, a zombie NAFTA for several months, perhaps years, uh, in which the agreement is neither alive nor dead. We have negotiated it as long as we can. We've got pretty good text a uh, pretty good agreement to modernize this deal, and we can't do anything with it because it's going to be held up in a political or legal process fundamentally controlled by the U.S. Okay. 
We, uh, I have one more question for the panel, but we have time probably for at least one question from the audience. Uh, does anyone have a question? Yes, sir. Sorry, Steve Sullivan, Small Business Administration. I, I really enjoyed listening to this group. I mean, together, you're fantastic. But as somebody mentioned early, earlier, you're kind of preaching to the choir here. I mean, we're all on board with you. And I'm just wondering, are you doing anything together? Or can you do anything, I don't know, to engage college campuses or, or bring in somebody like Kim Kardashian on your team to attract <laughs> some attention? But how do, you, how do you get this message out beyond us? Great question. So, I mean, one of the things that the, the Mexico Institute is doing right now is that we've entered into uh, a, a cooperative uh, uh, experience with, uh, with uh, the, the Bush Center, um, with the Center for American Progress, and with the McCain Institute. We've called it the U.S.-Mexico Task Force. And, and one of the major goals of this exercise is to get the word out beyond the beltway. Um, and so our first event uh, outside the Beltway will actually be in Kansas City. Um, and we want to try to explain why Mexico matters to the people who live um, in, uh, sort of in middle America. We want to get the idea out to them that Mexico is a part of their daily lives in a positive way, without hiding any of the, sort of the, the unfortunate truths about Mexico. But we want to talk about why it matters for security reasons. We want to talk about why Mexico matters for economic reasons, and of course, the integration of the societies. Now, with our meager resources, even pooling resources, you know, it's, it's still a, a heavy lift for us. And so we're looking for uh, support from the, uh, the corporate community to try to help us to do that. And luckily, we have very supportive boards that have corporate members who are willing to help us in terms of hosting an event uh, in a place like Kansas City. Um, but I think that you know, this, is, th this is what we can do as think tanks. But as you know, has been suggested here, we need to do think outside of the box. And one of the ideas that's been working around my, my head recently is the need to bring together some of the creative industries um, from places like Mexico to tell a much better story about Mexico. And you think there's so many great stories. I don't know how many of you here have seen that ad for Modelo Especial with, I, I, I want to say it's Juan Cruz, but I think that's not his name. But anyway, he is a Mexican undocumented migrant who earned his citizenship by serving in the US Armed Forces, is a, uh, has been decorated multiple times. And it's just a terrific ad. I mean, in 30 seconds, you're like, hey, this is an immigrant who has done a great job. You need a lot more of that. Because that change in the image of Mexico and of immigrants um, will help to convince people that, in fact, Mexico is a friend to the U.S., and having a free trade agreement with them is not such a bad thing after all. Um, I would just say, Steve, that um, I'm, I'm glad you're going to Kansas City. Kansas, Kansas City is a fantastic place, but I will say this. Kansas City knows, I mean, I don't know who's going to be at your event, but Kansas City has been very proactive in working with Mexico and Canada and reaching out um, across borders, and a lot of the people there are very well educated on the importance of Mexico to their city. Um, and what we find working out at the grassroots level is that when you get to the, the, the bigger cities in those areas, the more urban cities, they generally support NAFTA. The businesses out there support NAFTA. It's when you get slightly out of them um, where you have trouble. And so when you're going to these locations, um, you can reach out to the surrounding area, but those people that disagree with you do not come. Um, and then you think about the press and the media. So you try to do articles and maybe they'll read, but the people that don't agree with you don't read those articles. Um, you know, the people that are here, the people that might be watching, on a, if we're live webcasting, I don't know. I mean, those are the people that you don't need to speak to because they're obviously interested in this stuff already. Um, and that's why I was kind of making the joke about Kim Kardashian and stuff, but what has happened, so we've, we've been working on this for 20 years, trying to get people to change their minds. Um, the people that are non-believers. And it is very, very difficult. Um, and one issue, one, what we tried to do is go to the local elected officials, um, the mayors, the county judges, uh, state legislators. And it's been a very disappointing process. There are a few exceptions. Um, but overall, when you go to them saying, look, your constituents really don't believe that NAFTA is good, we have information that can change their minds, they will say to us, and this is a literal, like I've had this conversation so many times, I can't even tell you. 
we understand that NAFTA is important. We understand it's been good for even for our communities, but our my constituents hate it so much that I am not willing to lead them and try to change their mind because I will not. I will be met with such resistance that I won't get reelected. So essentially, we have a real issue at the local level with local elected officials not wanting to stand up and be leaders. They just want to get reelected, and, it, and it's it's hurting us. Okay. And so there's a lot going on out there that really, that's why I say I don't want us to have a withdrawal, but whatever we're doing in the future, we have not educated. I think with the new NAFTA, farmers originally, a lot of the farming community and ranching community, um, I think many of them were pro-Trump because they didn't, they, they thought NAFTA was bad for the country. And I think they've, what they've learned is that their produce and their meats and their dairy, um, they were selling them to intermediaries. They weren't selling them straight to Mexicans and straight to Canadians. But I think through this process, the farming and ranching community has been very well educated on the importance of NAFTA to them. So I think there's some people that have changed their minds, but it's because it affects their pocketbooks. So we've got to get the message out. That's kind of the whole everything you touch, see, eat, smell, use all day. Like if we could figure out a way to educate people on your, you know, your vegetables, your clothing, your com electronics, your computer equipment, your cars, and make them understand that if we don't have NAFTA, here's how much they're going to cost. Or if we do have a renegotiated NAFTA, thanks to the renegotiated NAFTA, this is staying the same price or going down. You know what I mean? That's the kind of stuff that I think, and that, that is a massive undertaking. But we are partnering with lots of different groups, binational organizations, other organizations that are pro-traders, trying to get common messaging so that we don't have disjointed ways of explaining the same thing. So we have been working on that. But honestly, it's a heavy, heavy lift out at the grassroots area for the non-believers. And a lot of it is wrapped around illegal immigration in Mexico also. And that's very hard to dissect, even though they have nothing to do with one another. Or briefly. Just quickly, Sorry. small business are the forgotten beneficiaries of uh, free trade agreements. When we did the NAFTA, we did the Canada-US free trade agreement, we were operating on a big business agenda. And that was the right thing to do. They were the vanguard. They were doing the greatest volume of trade. Now we have this opportunity to reduce transaction costs at the border, reduce regulatory duplication, make things easier, faster. Uh, small businesses are, uh, American small businesses, their first natural market is either Canada or Mexico and we're denying them the opportunity to do what they do best. Uh, entrepreneurship, free enterprise, uh, the ability, the can-do attitude is born in the United States. Now we're telling Americans, oh, you should be afraid of competition. You shouldn't take your better mousetrap and s try to sell it to your neighbors. You, sh you should hunker down and wait for better times. That is really unfortunate. It's your constituents, Steve, that are missing out on what is really could be a, uh, a renaissance of trade. And uh, I do Chamber of Commerce speeches. I do Rotary Club speeches. I do barley grower speeches, so you know, if I can help, let me know. <laughs> well, we're about out of time, but this gentleman has been patiently waiting, so we're going to take his question as the last one from the audience. But panel, we need a 30-second or so answer on this one, okay? All right. Well, at the risk of being controversial, does it all matter? Um, when you have sort of the pervasiveness of fake news out there and uh, people not knowing what to believe anymore and any signs you might put up about where stuff is made or who produced what, um, being, you know, well, that's just the corporate interest, which are why we're renegotiating NAFTA anyway. How do you get around that, uh, that increasingly pervasive fake news, nobody knows what to believe anymore when we're trying to do an education process? I'm going to cede to Tiffany. She tells me Angela Merkel's pregnant, and that's very interesting. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I don't, I guess I'm, I'm, your question about why does it all matter, I mean, I think we'll find out, depending on how things go, we'll find out pretty quickly, you know, if, and I think that it does matter. Um, and I feel like it's too bad that we have to be a reactionary society in the U.S., but I think if there's a certain amount of pain, cost of goods in the marketplace go up, the jobs they think are coming back aren't going to come back because they didn't, they weren't lost because of NAFTA anyway, that I think the very people that might have been supportive on this issue of let's, let's get out of NAFTA because NAFTA has been bad, that perhaps if it affects their pocketbooks and their lives and it didn't turn out the way they thought it would, that that would be the way to change their minds. Um, I don't know that you can change their minds with all the press in the world, with all the statistics in the world, because they've made up their minds. Um, so, and, and so I just think if we do end up with a review process every five years, it becomes that much more important for organizations like all of ours to get the word out if we do have a renegotiated NAFTA that this is helps. Uh, and that, that's, a harder, that's a harder point to make because it would be less impressive. It's, it's easy to say if your avocado goes from $2 to $5, this is because we withdrew from NAFTA. But if, if it stays at 2 you know, who knows what happens. So, so it's, it's a very difficult situation. 
I will say for a, a tiny bit of optimism, you know, our organizations that we work with out at the grassroots level, the North American companies that are part of our group, um, they have said that no matter what happens with NAFTA, they're going to stay North American companies. They don't see themselves picking up operations in Mexico or Canada and moving them back to the U.S. They'll stay North American companies. What they want most is certainty. They want to know what the frick is going on and what are the rules going to be. And they'll pass, if whatever costs are increased to them, they'll pass on to the consumer. They're not really that worried about it. They're going to keep doing their business. But if the cost goes up, then sure, the cost of goods are going to go up. So that's where it hurts the U.S. consumer. And I think that's about the only way we're going to ever change anybody's minds at this point in the game. Uh, I hope I'm wrong. Okay. I've got one last question for our panel. Uh, you know, everybody in this room wants to leave with this one nugget of information that nobody else uh, has. They can go back to their group, their organization, and say, I learned from Laura or Duncan or Tiffany. I know what's going to happen in NAFTA. <laughs> so in 30 seconds or less, what's going to happen in the NAFTA negotiations? Are we going to get, in your opinion, a new and improved NAFTA or not? 30 seconds each 30 other. seconds. As you do so well, the United States is going to, the United States political process is going to drive this truck 100 miles an hour towards the edge of the cliff. And then in that last five minutes, five feet before you hit the edge of the cliff, I'm hopeful that some political or judicial intervention will stop uh, the worst excesses of mercantilism from taking root. So NAFTA survives. NAFTA survives, just barely. Okay, Tiff. I hope that's the case. Um, I will pose another alternative, which is that we get a lot of work done in the really critical areas that have been discussed already, but these so-called poisonous pills can't get worked out, and that we, uh, in, in an effort to avoid, I don't think we have that patient of a president, so the zombie NAFTA thing, in my opinion, um, while it might be the best of the worst options, if what I'm saying is true, I don't know that Trump allows a zombie NAFTA to happen. I think he may withdraw just to have something that he's done, that he can show that he has done and accomplished, and since he campaigned so hard on NAFTA's the worst, I suspect that rather than being patient and letting it be a zombie NAFTA, he may withdraw. So NAFTA ends? Uh, we withdraw, but then it gets hung up in legislation in Congress. Okay. All right, Duncan? Trade lawyers that I've spoken to go between 60% and 85% probability of termination or failure of the NAFTA talks. Um, economists apparently believe there's a 25 to 40% chance that it won't work. Um, for me personally, it depends on which side of the bed I get out of in the morning. Um, who was the last person I spoke to? Well, how about and today? Today, I actually feel a little bit more optimistic, I have to say. I had a nice yeah. breakfast this morning, and so uh, <laughs> I'm thinking that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm probably 60-40 uh, probably in terms of okay. uh, termination. All right. Hey, you guys were terrific. Please uh, join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Wilkins, and to my fellow panelists. Thank you to Matt Rooney from the uh, George Bush Institute. Uh, thank you to my, my colleagues at the uh, Wilson Center, in particular, Lynn Proctor. Uh, Lynn Platt, our North American Competitiveness Fellow, and Ben Proctor, who were the co-leads on this. Uh, thanks to all. Come back again anytime. We are happy to see your smiling faces. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning.